Uh, when it comes to electronegativity, your most electronegative is fluorine. Your least electronegative is cesium. That's your general trend. You'll notice that based on the height through this figure that it's not perfect, but that gets you pretty close. Right? So to determine the exact balance of electrons within a structure, you would officially have to go back and use the electronegativities. Okay? Or what you can do is approximate. And that's what I want you to be able to do, is you've got the general trend for electronegativity, so use some approximative skills to figure out what's happening with those electrons. So if we take a look at our first example, the bond between oxygen and hydrogen. Right, well, if we look at our periodic table, uh, which is closer to fluorine? Oxygen, which means the bonding electrons, that line in the middle, is starting to be drawn towards the oxygen. Well, the electrons that made up that bond, officially one came from oxygen, one came from hydrogen. Right. Well, if oxygen accepts that extra electron or starts to take it away from hydrogen, oxygen has now gained an electron. Well, what charge is an electron? Negative. So as that oxygen accepts an electron, it starts to become negative. Conversely, the hydrogen just lost an electron, so it starts to become positive. So this notation allows us to see that charge imbalance within the structure. Right. However, if we use this notation, this now is indistinguishable from an ionic bond. Well, this is not an ionic bond. This is two nonmetals. So we need to change our notation so that we can understand that this is not officially an ionic bond. To do that, we still want to imply or show that we're building these charges, but we want to make sure that those charges are not officially fully charged. They are becoming negative. They are becoming positive. We could write becoming next to each of those. Okay, that's tedious. So instead, we use the delta symbol. Okay, and it's a lowercase delta, which people have shown as the infinity sign or a weird-looking S. Okay. As long as there's some kind of weird-looking symbol next to your charge, most people will understand what you're referencing is the partial charge. Okay. What happens if we look at the next one? It's the wrong eraser. Carbon and oxygen. Oxygen is closer to our fluorine, so it is predicted to be more electronegative than our carbon. So oxygen starts to take the electrons in that bond. As oxygen takes those electrons, it starts to become partially negative, And the carbon becomes partially positive. In the last case, Nitrogen versus fluorine. Fluorine is more electronegative, which means the electrons are moving towards the fluorine. The fluorine becomes partially negative. Our nitrogen becomes partially positive. That's it. That's all we're doing with partial charges. All we're trying to do is establish where the electrons are moving within an individual structure. Please reconnect. Okay. Why is this relevant? That is a very good question, and we should be talking about why it is relevant when we talk about bonding. Unfortunately, that's not the order of our class because we've decided the why it's relevant part is really relegated to a minor aspect of Chem 130. Okay. We will have a big, long lecture talking about why it's important because we'll look at bonding and forces much later in the semester after exam three. Probably the most important part of all chemistry happens in interpreting these charges and how now these molecules interact with other molecules. And for some reason, we've decided that that isn't important enough to talk about until organic chemistry. But it's what drives all chemistry. Okay? Questions? Okay, the next part looking at our shapes. So I'm going to pause the recording because predict your products if necessary.
Okay. Step two says balance, but notice in step two, I'm not balancing the equation. I'm balancing my formulas. By balancing the formulas, what I'm doing is balancing the products that I've just predicted. Okay. Which means to do that, you have to go back and use all of those same rules and thoughts that went through your head when you did nomenclature. When you put iron next to oxygen, how do you know how many irons need to be there versus how many oxygens? It's based on the charge of oxygen and the charge on iron. And you adjust the amounts of each of those so that the overall charge is zero. zero. Right, so when you're predicting products, your overall charge will still come out to be zero. Once you have your formulas balanced, then and only then should you move to balancing the equation. It does not matter what atom or technically complex ion you start with. Okay? However, as a general rule of thumb, avoid hydrogen and oxygen until the very end. Okay? And that's because hydrogen and oxygen tend to show up in a lot of different places. If you're trying to balance hydrogen and it shows up in three different places in the reactant and three different places in the product, that becomes very difficult to balance it because then what ones do you change to get it to balance out? So avoid those. Because if you're lucky, when you get to them at the very end, it's already balanced itself out, and you don't have to worry about them. Okay? You will balance by changing whole numbers in front of the formulas, also known as the coefficient. Okay? So you'll go through and then repeat this cycle until you've balanced every single atom, and make sure that the number of atoms on the reactant side equal the number of atoms on the product side. And then you will check your work several times over. Remember, this is the fun one. Everybody gets mad at me because you checked your work so much. Once you've checked your work, you check your work again. Okay? At that point, you should also then go through and check the numbers that you've placed in there. You must verify that you use the smallest whole numbers possible. Okay? We've seen this before. Smallest whole numbers possible. What is the formula for sodium chloride? Okay, somebody other than you. Formula for sodium chloride. NaCl. Chloride's a minus one, sodium's a plus one, it's balanced. Why don't I not write Na2Cl2? Isn't that balanced? Yeah. Na3, oops, that's like a... Stacked three. Na3Cl3. Is that balanced? Yeah. Okay. When we go through the balance, we always use the smallest whole number possible. Okay. Always. So the very last thing you should do is verify because maybe through your processing up here, you cycled through a couple times and kept changing numbers and you actually scaled up beyond what you needed to. Okay, it happens. So check your work. Make sure that you've used the smallest whole numbers. Make sense? Okay. Uh, remind me, do we balance the aluminum sulfate one? Yeah. Okay. So let's look at the last one. Okay. When we go through and attempt to balance that one, I'm going to balance it up and put stuff my work above it because I've got more space above it. I said to worry about hydrogen last, so if I look at the first thing I might balance, I might say, well, polyatomic ions. Carbonate, CO3, is a polyatomic ion. So I might try to balance that. Try that again. Balance carbonate on both sides of the equation. Well, how many carbonates are on the reactant side? How many carbonates are on the product side? Zero. <laughs> I cannot balance the complex ion because it doesn't exist on the product side. Okay, so I'm going to have to go through and balance this according to the atoms. So I'll start with my carbon. How many carbons on the reactant? One product, one. Okay. Which should I try and balance now, hydrogen or oxygen? Why hydrogen? I agree with you. The hydrogens stayed with each other through the course of the equation. 
right? Meaning hydrogen shows up once on the reactant side and it shows up once on the product side. If I'd used oxygen first, oxygen shows up once on the reactant side and twice on the product side. That could potentially cause problems if I tried to balance the oxygen first. Right? Hydrogen on the reactant side is two. Hydrogen on the product side, two. Oxygen now, reactant side, and three. So my equation is balanced. The sum of the coefficients is three. Remember, we have implied ones in front of every single one of those. So what we'll do is add all of those values, and we get three for our sum of the coefficients. It helps me ask a question, <laughs> a multiple choice question on the exam. That's the only reason. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So now that we have some understanding of how to balance chemical reactions, we're going to start to classify our chemical reactions according to individual types. Okay. There are five, if I counted correctly, types of chemical reactions. You need to be able to look at a chemical reaction and not only balance it, but be able to classify it. Oh, that reaction, well, that's a decomposition. That reaction is a double replacement. Okay? You need to be able to look at it and say very quickly, that is what's going on within it. Okay? Why? Some of these reactions, you are expected to predict the product of that reaction. If you don't know what reaction you're looking at, it becomes very difficult to predict it. Okay? So within the format up here, I tried to match this up uh, in such a way that you could then see the general pattern. In your combination, you take two species and you end with one. So you took two things and you combined them to make one. In a decomposition, you start with one thing and you end up with Two, because you decomposed it, tore it into its individual pieces. Single replacement reaction. What happens? I replaced B with A. Did I do any other replacements or just that one? Just that one, meaning single replacement. What happens if I exchange two things? I now have a double replacement. In the double replacement, we could reference it as the cation switch. Does the order matter? No. So is it just a cation switch? I could also classify it as an anion switch, as long as you only do one of them. If you switch the cations and switch the anions, what happens? You didn't switch anything. You didn't switch anything okay? So pick one to freeze its location and then switch the other ones. Neutralization reactions. Take a careful look at the neutralization reaction. Does it look familiar? Good, yes is a good answer. What does it look like? We switch this around. We are combining these two and combining these two. A neutralization reaction is a double replacement. Why is it pulled out as a separate reaction? Most chemistry, or almost all chemistry, centered around the discovery of one type of reaction. The acid-base reaction, also known as neutralization. It is such an important reaction that it gets its own classification, even though all it really is is a double replacement. Okay. So, now that you guys have those memorized and perfectly awesome, First reaction, what happened? I took two things and I made one. What reaction does that? Combination. Good, I'm starting to like the chorus. We're waking up. Second reaction. Combination. Third reaction. Double replacement. Fourth reaction. Decomposition. Look for the patterns to classify your reaction. 
Questions on any of those? One quick note, when we look at the double replacement, I took sulfate and I exchanged it with the nitrate, right? So I have barium sulfate as a product. Where'd it go? There it is. Okay. How many sulfates did I start with? Three. Three. How many sulfates have I shown? One. One. Why did I only show one sulfate here? This had three. When I do the double replacement, aren't I supposed to switch the whole thing across? That's what your coefficient is for. Why is the three next to the sulfate in our reactant? What does that three mean? Why are there three? To neutralize what? the charge on aluminum. When I move over to the product, why do I not have three sulfates? I only need one sulfate to balance the charge on barium. So when we do the exchange, you swap your cation and anion, and then just evaluate your charges, balance the formula first. Once the formula is balanced, then you can worry about balancing the equation. Make sure you are careful on transferring subscripts across. Sulfate, SO4. That 4, you'll notice, did transfer across. Why did the 4 transfer across? It's a polyatomic ion. The 4 transferred across for the same reason that I didn't write just B SO4. Because it's barium, I need the A. The 4 is what makes that sulfate. The 3 is there to balance the sulfate with the aluminum. So be careful on the meaning of what your subscripts reference. Kind of make sense? Okay. It's kind of fun to kick balloons around. <laughs> Sorry? 0.2 seconds. Wait, where? Now I'm confused. Uh, no, you're good. This one? Yeah. Okay. So, what would you potentially like make a question like for? Oh, I don't know how to spray that. I don't know how to that. Um, let's let's hold it because yeah. we will go through a couple questions. So for each of these types, we're going to look at examples and what I would expect you to be able to do. Okay. So the first one, combination reactions. Okay. Sometimes also referred to as a synthesis by very few people. Okay. But you could see it as that. We will look at three types of combination reactions. The reaction of a metal with oxygen, the reaction of a non-metal with oxygen, and the reaction of a metal and a non-metal. Okay. Within those contexts, you should be able to come up with some kind of prediction for this. You'll notice that I actually have a question already set up. Right. The magne or magnesium metal reacts with oxygen gas to produce. Right. What do you think I'm asking you with this single question? What's the product? Good call. The context of this is a little bit difficult. Some of these are easier to predict than others. Okay, so combinations, I don't really expect you to be able to predict, but you should be able to predict this one. To predict it, it may be helpful if we had an equation. So this question isn't just saying, what's the product? It's asking you to go through and look at an equation. So let's convert this question, what we know for, from it, into an equation. What is the symbol for magnesium metal? Solid. We need the phase. Right, for those of you that don't like writing phases, keep taking chemistry until you get to organic. We ignore phases in organic. Right. Magnesium solid reacts with oxygen gas. How do I say reacts with? Plus. Symbol for oxygen gas. O2. Why is it O2? 
It's a diatomic element. Okay? Have no fear of. We have to have the O2. What phase? Or face? What phase? Gas. How do I specify that? With my parentheses gas. This then produces what? Well, if it's a combination, I'm going to combine magnesium with oxygen. Okay, and this is where we have to be careful. Why is the 2 next to O2 in our reactant? Because it is diatomic. Should that 2 move with the magnesium oxide? No. Not necessarily. The only reason it should move with it is to make sure the formula magnesium oxide is correct. How do we know if that formula is correct? Charges. charges. All those charges we told you to memorize. What is the charge on oxygen? Negative 2. I switched it up on you. What's the charge on magnesium? Plus 2. How many oxygens? How many magnesiums? One and one. This formula is correct. The two does not come with the oxygen. We have now predicted the product of the combination reaction. So let's layer on the next aspect. Is the equation balanced? No. So I need to balance it. How do we balance? Nope, I can't say plus oxygen. This equation is now correct for the combination. If I say plus oxygen, I'm no longer doing a combination reaction. Two things become one. I have to change the coefficients. So we go back. How many magnesiums on the reactant side? One and one. How many oxygens on the reactant side? Two and one. Is that balanced? What do you have to do? We need to change the coefficient, which is the number in front. As soon as we've changed a number of one of our coefficients, we need to go back and check. Magnesium. How many magnesiums on the reactant side? One. How many magnesiums on the product side? Two. What do I do? I need a two in front of the magnesium on the reactant side so that it also becomes two. I do not touch the subscripts. If I touch the subscript, that word, I'm changing the formula. Not allowed to change the formula. Okay. How many oxygens? Two and two. How many magnesiums? Two and two. Questions? Okay. Since you all look bored with that, whoops, come on, reconnect. Do this one on your own. If you got a question. So we pick it up again. Sulfur solid plus oxygen gas. Notice it's diatomic. Goes to SO2. Ooh, that two moved across. Why did that two move across? What's that? It's dioxide. Did the two actually move across? I would argue no. The two in the product side is from the name sulfur dioxide. The two on the reactant side is from the name oxygen gas. Okay? So those twos have entirely different meanings, which is really obnoxious because they look identical. So you have to be careful with that. What changed about this equation from the last problem? True. Tells you what the product is. The last one, I kind of expect you to be able to predict the product. This one, I didn't expect you to predict the product. Why? Something about charge, what were you saying? No. Charge wouldn't balance if we predicted it. I would argue that's not quite true. You have an interesting concept there. What do you mean charge wouldn't balance? Sulfur and oxygen in ionic bonds are the same charge. 
Is this an ionic bond? No. You do not have the ability to predict formulas for covalent bonds. You only have the ability to predict for ionic bonds. Okay? So if you're reacting to nonmetals, you will be given what that product is. Make sense? Questions? Should we do the metal in a nonmetal? So would that like be the answer? That would be the answer. Exactly as I wrote. Uh yeah. Now that I've deleted it. Should have asked a little bit longer. So we had sulfur solid plus oxygen gas to produce SO2. So the question I would have asked in this case is provide the balanced equation. That is the answer. Okay. Everything comes out as balanced. I could also ask what is the sum of the coefficients of the balanced equation? The answer would be 3. Those are all ones. Notice I did not specify the phase on that last one. I should have written that into the question. You don't know, so don't worry about it. Sulfur dioxide is technically a gas. I should have written produce gaseous sulfur dioxide. So that's why I didn't include it there, because I didn't give you the information to answer that. All right. You guys want to try one more? All right. Take a swing at this one. 30 seconds. Lithium metal, the symbol for lithium metal. Li solid. How do we know the phase on lithium metal? Oh, that was dumb. Never mind. I didn't ask that question. Um, symbol for bromine? Br? Beer? I have to specify the two. Uh, and it says bromine gas, so I know the phase is a gas. This is going to form LiBr. Why do I have the two in the reactant for the bromine? It's a diatomic element. So when I look to the product, I cannot transfer the two across because is it a diatomic element anymore? No, no it's in a compound. So I have to evaluate what's happening within that compound. Lithium has what charge? Positive one. Bromide has negative one. Is that balanced, the formula? The formula is balanced. It is LIBR. Now I have to balance the equation. Balancing the equation, how many lithiums do I have? Reactant and product. One and one. Bromine's on the reactant. Two, product. One, fix it. Change the coefficient which means I will end up having to change the lithium as well. Some of the coefficients would be 5. Okay. Does that get you a better idea of questions? Okay. Decomposition reactions. In a decomposition reaction, we're taking a single compound and breaking it into two pieces. Okay. So let's take a swing at balancing this one. Heating solid mercury 2 oxide produces mercury metal and oxygen gas. So what do we start with? I actually don't like this example, but it's close enough. What's our reactant? Mercury 2 oxide. What is our symbol for mercury? What is our symbol for oxide? Oxide is just O. It is not O2. O2 is the formula for diatomic oxygen gas. This is not oxygen gas. This is mercury oxide. It's in a compound. What is the charge on oxygen? Negative 2. What is the charge on the mercury? You all memorize that one, right? Tells you in the formula. The Roman numerals, plus 2. Remember that whole thing where you have to know your nomenclature? Yeah. 
You need to know it. So we have a proper formula. Uh, and it says it's a solid, so we can specify that it's a solid. We heated it so we can get really nitpicky and show a delta symbol over our arrow because we said that represented adding heat. This produces mercury metal. What is the symbol for mercury metal? Hg. I'll accept solid there. It's not technically solid. We'll come back to that in a second. And oxygen gas. O2 gas. Why is mercury not a solid? It's a liquid. Okay, so when we're specifying our phases, we're usually referencing at room temperature. I definitely don't get that nasty nitpicky on it, but it should be referenced as a liquid. Is our equation balanced? What do we have to do? For those of you getting faster at it, we need to put a 2 in front of our HGO and in front of our HG. Yes? Up to you if you want to specify putting a 1 there. I personally will never put a 1 in front of an element because that, as much silly as it sounds, requires effort. Okay. Um, for answering questions initially, it's not a bad idea to include it because that will help you remember that you have to add that in for the sum of the coefficients. Okay. Metal hydrogen carbonates can decompose to give a metal, a metal carbonate, water, and carbon dioxide. So there's the general form telling you what could actually happen to it. So with that information, answer the following question. What does sodium hydrogen carbonate decompose into? Okay, and by answering that question, you should be able to draw out a balanced reaction equation. So if we start this off... Sodium hydrogen carbonate, symbol for sodium, Na, hydrogen carbonate, HCO3. One thing we should be careful of is to make sure the formula we just wrote is correct. What is, whoa, excuse me, there was breakfast. HCO3, I recorded that too, that's pleasant. <laughs> HCO3 is a complex ion with which charge? Minus 1. Carbonate has a minus 2. Hydrogen has a plus 1. When we put them next to each other, the overall charge is a minus 1. Sodium has what charge? Plus 1. Do our charges balance? Yes. yes. Now I've got a whole bunch of stuff written in the way, so I'm going to erase everything and draw again. Sodium hydrogen carbonate will decompose. So we're now saying forms products. What does it decompose to? To our equation up top, our information says it decomposes to give a metal carbonate. What is the formula for a carbonate? Carbonate, CO3. What is our metal in this case? Sodium. We'll come back to that in a second. What else does it decompose into? Water and... CO2, carbon dioxide. A metal hydrogen carbonate yeah. becomes a metal carbonate. Sodium is a metal. Just translates across. I mean, I'm, other than that, I'm not sure what else to say. Like, where, where the, if you didn't see the bottom part where it says sodium, where would you know sodium came in? You wouldn't. The top part is the general format. The bottom part is the question. I'd have to tell you the question. Okay. So should we start balancing the equation yet? No. We're going to have a really hard time balancing the equation as is. Why? That formula is incorrect. It is sodium and it is carbonate. But what is the charge on carbonate? Charge on sodium? plus one. Charge does not balance. Before I can balance the equation, I must balance my product. Okay. How do I balance that formula? 
it has to be Na2. I do not change the coefficient. Changing the coefficient is balancing the equation. I don't care about the equation right now. All I care about is that formula. So I'm going to make that Na2CO3. Now my formula is correct. Now I can balance the equation. Sodium's on the reactant side. Product side. What do I have to do? I need to make the reactant have one more. So there's two now on that side. Carbon's on the reactant side. I do only see carbon show up once, but the coefficient in front applies to everything afterwards. So there are two carbons on the reactant side. On the product side, I have two. Uh, what do I want to do next? Let's do hydrogen. How many hydrogens on the reactant side? I heard a couple answers there. I don't know why I just put a line through that. It's two. The two applies to directly after. We have two hydrogens on the reactant side. How many on the product side? Two. The subscript two applies to whatever's directly in front of it. Our hydrogen's balanced. Oh, yep. Sorry. Yes, hydrogen's balanced. We can now move to oxygen. Oxygen's on the reactant side. Six. Good answer. The three applies to what's directly in front of it, which is the oxygen. It is then multiplied by the two out front, and I've got six oxygens on the reactant side. On the product side, I have... Oh, yeah, I totally did not count that right. Sorry. Three, four, five, six. Oxygen showed up in three places. Oxygen is balanced. What do we do now? Check. Check it. Because I want to keep going, I'm actually not going to check it. But we now have our balanced equation. The sum of our coefficients would be 5. Okay. Questions? Would it be incorrect to write it as HNaCO3 for sodium hydrogen carbonate? This is technically incorrect. On a short answer, I would not take off points. You will never see it written like that uh, in a multiple choice answer. You should always put the metal first. Okay. The other thing you can use is if you look at the name, which comes first, sodium or hydrogen? Sodium. Sodium. Do it based off of the name. Metal carbonates decompose to give a metal oxide and CO2. So here's our new question. What does calcium carbonate decompose into? Give a balanced equation. If we pick this one up, symbol for calcium, CA. Remember how we told you to memorize certain elements? Kind of need to know them. Formula for carbonate, CO3. What's the charge on carbonate? Charge on calcium, plus 2. Is our formula balanced? Yes. This decomposes to give a metal oxide. What is our metal in this case? What is oxide? O. Oh, what's the charge on O? Charge on calcium. Is our formula balanced? Yes. Plus CO2. Oh, you can tell I got really lazy there instead of writing carbon dioxide. We've got CO2. We now have our predicted. Is this our balanced equation? Oh, yeah, look at that. It sure is. Some of the coefficients? Three. What do you guys think? Straightforward? Okay. So let's make it more complicated. Single replacement reactions. Okay. These take a little bit to process. Predictions are needed for single replacement reactions. Okay. The rest of the ones, I did have you kind of work through examples where you were predicting them. Don't stress about predicting those. The single replacements, sorry, I had to make sure I'm recording. Uh, absolutely, you need to be able to predict with these. So in our general formula, A plus some compound goes to B plus some compound. Iron solid is mixed with aqueous copper 2 sulfate solution. 
So we're taking iron solid FeS plus copper 2 sulfate. Why is the 2 there? To specify the charge, which then tells us that it's a one-to-one -one ratio. There's one copper, one sulfate. Okay. What would we predict our product to be? Okay. We're going to end up with copper by itself. We'll address charge in a second. Plus iron sulfate. This was kind of a bad example, and I always keep forgetting to go back and fix these freaking examples here. Somebody pointed out iron 2 sulfate. Do you know it's iron 2? No. Technically, you don't. Let's work under the assumption that it is iron plus 2 okay, in the course of this reaction, okay, which means our product is indeed FeSO4. Okay, so that is balanced, plus 2 minus 2. We have an interesting dilemma here. When we first wrote this out, I heard someone say copper ion. So let's go ahead and say that. So let's say it was copper plus 2. I now know that I'm referencing copper ion. Don't write that down, please. Okay. Copper plus 2. What is the overall charge on the reactant side of the equation? Upper right-hand corner of iron is 0. So the charge coming from iron is zero. zero. Upper right-hand corner from copper sulfate is zero. zero. So the charge from copper sulfate is zero. zero. What's the overall charge on our product side right now? Plus two. How do we become plus two? Changing the balance of electrons. Right? So to become plus 2, we had to lose 2 electrons. Our electrons matter. Yes. As our equation is written, what just happened to matter? It disappeared. Bit of a problem. Okay. Turns out that when we run the single replacement reaction, we do not form copper plus 2. We form... Copper metal. Okay. So this is an interesting thing to happen here. We're going to look at this in a little bit more depth as we continue through this. Copper started as what in the reactant side? Copper what? Copper sulfate. True, what was its charge? Plus 2. On the product side, what does it become? Just copper with zero charge. What happened to the iron? Started at zero and it ended at copper, or sorry, iron plus two. For copper to go to a, from a plus two to a zero, what had to happen? It had to gain electrons. So I could write an electron over here. How many electrons did it gain? Two. For iron to go from a 0 to a plus 2, what had to happen to it? It had to lose electrons. Where would I write a loss of electrons? On the product side. I would just say plus 2 electrons. Okay. When we go through, good question, why not write minus 2 electrons? Our balanced equation always gives us positive values. Always. We never have negative values. I could write negative 2 on the reactant side, but that's the same as saying plus 2 on the product side. Okay. Electrons. How stable are they? Not very. Remember, finger electrical outlet, bad idea. Okay. Incredibly unstable. So when we go through and look at a reaction, we cannot just have electrons come out from nowhere. We can't have them disappear to nowhere. Something has to give them up. Something has to accept them. To allow this reaction to occur, iron has to give up two electrons, and copper must be present to accept those two electrons. 
So when we're looking at a single replacement reaction, we are converting one species in its elemental state to an ion, and at the same time, we're converting an ion into its elemental state. That is happening through an exchange of electrons. Okay. How do we know that this reaction actually occurred? That is a much trickier question. If I tell you that you need to be able to predict that this reaction occurred, you have to tell me not only what those products are by exchanging everything, but then saying, yes, that was a valid reaction. The only way you would know it's a valid reaction is if you have some information about the reactivity of iron relative to copper. That reactivity information is stored in something known as an activity series. Okay? So we've got an example activity series here. Okay? You'll notice it says decreasing activity. Lithium is at the top of this, meaning it is very, very reactive. If we see lithium metal by itself, it is dying to become an ion. Anything in its life wants to become an ion. Gold, on the other hand, not reactive. Okay? Gold as a metal wants to stay a metal, does not become an ion. Does that make sense based on what we've observed in our natural existence? Most money is backed based on our reserves of gold. Gold has been our standard currency for a really long time. Why did we pick gold to be our currency form? It stays constant. Throughout gold's lifetime, it doesn't change to become something else. Okay? It will always be gold. Let's think about this. Let's flip it and say, well, why is that important? Let's say lithium is our standard for currency. We've got the giant reserves, what are they, Fort Knox, with all of our gold stashed inside it, all of our wealth. Let's say that that is now with lithium. Another country comes along and says, U.S., I want to destroy you. Okay? Instead of taking out people, all they have to do is dress up in clown suits and throw a bunch of water at Fort Knox. What happens to lithium when it hits water? It explodes very violently and becomes lithium ion. What happened to all of our wealth? It's gone. Okay. We picked currencies based on chemistry. Okay. Those species don't react. What are some other metals that we value? Silver, platinum. Where are silver and platinum on this activity series? Right next to gold at the very bottom of this. Those species do not react very frequently, and so we can use them as a standard currency because that value won't change or that material doesn't change. If I've got five grams of gold, tomorrow I'll have five grams of gold. It'll stay constant. Okay. So how do we use this to interpret our reactions? Okay. Well, let's go back to our iron and copper example. When we predicted our product, we said in one case, or in this case, I ended up with copper solid plus iron sulfate, right? Is that a correct? Okay. How can I use my activity series? Okay. Well, I'm going to pick, say, iron versus copper. In the course of this reaction, copper goes from being an ion to becoming a metal all by itself. Iron goes from being by itself to becoming an ion. So what I'll do is look at my activity series and identify them. Here's iron. Where's copper? There's copper at the bottom. According to that, copper, just like gold, would rather be a metal, does not want to be an ion. It's at the bottom of our activity series okay, relative to iron. Where is copper a metal in our equation? On the product side. On the product side. For copper to become a metal, what has to happen? The reaction must occur.
copper ion must react with iron to form the copper solid. What does that mean? This reaction works. Okay. We can predict our products by doing our single replacement reaction, and we can then say that this reaction is indeed valid. Okay. How about some other quick examples here? Let's take a look at iron and HCl. This is a little bit trickier. Why is this trickier? Is hydrogen a metal? No, but what does hydrogen act like? What is the charge on hydrogen? Plus one. What charge are all our metals? Positive. Guess what hydrogen acts like? Metals. Okay, so we can throw hydrogen into this system and do the same process. So I want hydrogen by itself plus iron chloride. The charge on iron in this case will also say is a plus two. Okay. Is my formula for iron chloride balanced? If iron is a plus two, chloride is a negative one. Is that formula balanced? What do I have to do? It needs to become two chlorides. Is my formula for hydrogen by itself correct? Why not? Hydrogen is a diatomic element. So if I'm going to form hydrogen by itself, it needs to become H2 gas. Okay. Should this reaction work? Well, let's go back to our activity series. I want to identify hydrogen relative to iron. So when we compare those two, which one would rather be by itself, hydrogen or iron? Hydrogen. hydrogen. Where is hydrogen by itself in our equation? On the product side, which means this reaction must work. Kind of neat. Can we do one more example? I'll take that as a yes. I need to erase all that so I have more space. Gold solid plus sulfuric acid. To do the double replacement, I want hydrogen by itself. So I'll end up with H plus, and we'll say gold. And for the sake of balancing, let's just say gold is a plus 2 in this case. If gold is a plus 2, what's our charge on sulfate? Negative 2 is our product balanced. Gold sulfate, yes. What is our formula for hydrogen by itself? H2 and a gas. Why do I have the 2 in H2? It's because it's diatomic. Why do I have the 2 in H2SO4? To balance charge, that says charge on SO4. I'm just running out of time. All right. Do I predict this reaction to occur? We identify hydrogen and we identify gold. Gold is lower on the activity series. It would rather be the metal, which means... Gold is on the reactant side. This reaction does not occur. Okay. In a multiple choice answer, you may very well see this. If I said predict the products and we wrote out H2 plus gold sulfate, that might very well show up as an answer. You would also see as an answer choice no reaction. No reaction would be the correct answer. Okay. Oh, what is today? Thursday? On Tuesday, I will have you go through, predict the reaction for gold, reacting with copper sulfate. We'll even make that a quiz, and then we'll probably move into, I think it's chapter, almost chapter 17. Please do pack up. I'm just going to talk over you. It's okay. Should you memorize the activity series? No. No.
I will give you a condensed version of the activity series. Right? It won't have just the ones you need to compare. It will probably have four or five on it. But I will give you a condensed version. If you take a look at your next exam, it does have examples of that. If you look at the practice exam. Um, 